action this July for a just recovery from the global COVID-19 health pandemic. Some people call it building back better or a just recovery, but either way, we want a recovery that puts people first with investment in good clean jobs, centering racial justice, climate justice, and support for countries around the world to do this well. In just over two weeks time, G20 finance ministers are meeting to discuss how they spend public money, our money, on a recovery from COVID. And there will be the EU summit on recovery also. We need to remind leaders that there is a clear choice here. Either it's back to business as usual with bailouts for big corporations and extractive industries that drive climate change and injustice, or globally, we take a new direction and we invest in a just recovery for all. We're here today to support and rally each other to action. We're living in unprecedented times and never has taking action been more urgent. So thank you so much for joining. Everyone is really crucial to this and we all help in our different ways. We at 350 have some template actions that I will share, is, share with you as we go along on this call. And please make sure that you do sign the petition at 350.org forward slash G20. But wherever you are, you can adapt actions to suit you. The point is that we want as many people as possible to participate. Um, I'm really happy that you're here and I really hope you enjoy the call today. Just to run through our speakers, we'll have Sharon Burrow from the ITUC joining us. Then we'll be hearing from Aaron Abagosh from the Council on Energy, Environment and Water from India. Nidhi Nakpil from the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development. Nakabuya Hilda Flavia from Fridays for Future Uganda. Lubna Syed Kadri from Wada Natoda Abiyan in India. And Tasniza Esop from Khan International, which is a really great lineup and I'm really excited to hear from everyone today. A quick note on participation. You will be muted for, for this call, but you can ask questions. Just use the Q&A box. It's not possible to ask questions directly as we go through the call. So please just write your questions into that box and we will collect them and try to answer some at the end. We have some colleagues supporting us on tech um, and you can use the chat function to direct message tech help and Nonna, Jenny and Katie will respond. And thanks, thanks to them for that. Um, and you can type any time into the chat, just make sure that the chat is set to all panelists and attendees. And as I mentioned, we are recording this and we'll share the, the YouTube link afterwards if you'd like to share it with others. Right, so now we've finished with housekeeping. I'm delighted to introduce you to Sharon Burrow from the ITUC. It's vital that we put unions and workers front and centre when we talk about a just recovery. So I'm delighted that she's here to speak to, to us today. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. And uh, a just recovery and just transitions. I love it. And thank you, 350.org, for your leadership. Because business as usual is not acceptable. We know what the failed model of economy bought for us. It actually brought a convergence of crisis even before COVID-19. That was a crisis of inequality. It was income inequality, racial injustice, gender injustice, and our world was divided. It was already driving an age of anger where you saw civil unrest. It brought us the climate emergency with the fight just to get the dangers to our homes, to our livelihoods, to our very lives actually recognised. So the climate emergency, front and centre. And of course, it also then morphed from a health crisis, which we have to actually you know, stand up and say, never again will we see our health and education and public services underfunded. But now the social and economic impact, the fallout is extraordinary. We could be witnessing the loss of 300 million jobs in the formal economy. And of those workers in the informal sectors, it is in fact uh, 1.6 billion workers of that 2 billion or so who are already facing destitution. That's just a calamity that is extraordinary. It's also morphing into a human rights uh, crisis and many leaders are hiding behind COVID-19 
to bring in the worst of authoritarian laws and indeed attacks on workers, on civil society, uh, activists, indeed the, the very citizens of their countries themselves. We released our Global Rights Index this week and 85% of countries have violated the right to strike. 80% of countries have violated the right to bargain collectively. The number of countries that impeded the registration of unions increased to 89 from 86 in 2019. They're the attacks on unions, then we know that the attacks on civil society organisations are equal to that. So we have a lot of work to do. Building back better, okay, but it sounds like we really want the same foundations, just better. New normal, same thing. So just recovery is exactly what we want. No more business as usual. We must have a recovery where people and the planet are aligned. It's that simple. So last week we actually held the a huge national, uh, international conversation, the biggest conversation on earth, and thank you for your support. And it was called Kapow, Climate and Employment Proof Our Workplace. How do we bring those things together so we build together a better future that actually gets us uh, that alignment that we want and gets us a just economic future, not one that is wedded to the 1% or to shareholder privilege or any of those uh, neoliberal frameworks that have left us uh, short of a focus on people and their uh, rights to be included in economic prosperity. I wanted to focus particularly today, because as we go from crisis to recovery, and we'll be in this coexistence mode for many uh, months, if not years yet, but recovery, we've spent some $10 trillion on the crisis. And we've seen some advances in the social contract. But as now we look to job creation, to uh, environmental uh, sustainability, we know that massive investment's going to be necessary in sustainable infrastructure, in uh, industry policy to transition to that net zero future. We know that investment in our public services is just unquestionably a priority. Investment in care. We saw those frontline workers, the majority of them women, some of the lowest paid workers, putting their lives on the line for us, risking their health and that of their families. And we must see that that investment is there. But we also need uh, repair of ecosystems. We need to look at where it is that we can drive jobs and sustainability together. And to do that, financing the recovery will be our biggest challenge. So as the G20 finance ministers meet, let me just give you a list of the things that we want, and I hope we can fight some of these together. An extension of debt relief. We, with a whole lot of allies, we saw 12 months of debt suspension for the most vulnerable countries. But now the African Union with Cyril Ramaphosa in the lead is actually calling for two years. While we might want to see some debt cancellation, we're gonna back in the two years as the start. And we're saying an end to conditionality that's about austerity, but rather the only condition has to be that those nations invest in uh, the sustainable development goals. We want to see, indeed, an agreement for a broader scope of drawing rights. Always an economic debate, but with stagflation effectively, then it can be afforded, and the liquidity swap mechanism can allow some of the more generous countries to, again, help with fiscal space in the vulnerable nations. But we want to see, if, you're th if you think we've got a 10 trillion spend already, could be tw two times that by the uh, point at which in the recovery we get to some hope, then it cannot be accepted that we can't find around $35 billion for five years to actually support a universal social protection scheme for the, the poorest and most vulnerable countries. That's the very bare, bare minimum the governments can do internationally in coordination. So that will be a big ask for us 
if we don't put resilience in the form of social protection and job security under our people, then the future looks very bleak indeed. We also, of course, want significant uh, uh, um, attention to taxation measures. Many of you with us have fought for uh, an end to the illicit flows out of developing countries, but also to just taxation um, measures in our own countries. Some of that, the elimination of tax havens, uh, the transparency of corporate ownership has to be back on the table, but so too does a digital tax and the transactions tax we fought for for so long to actually um, expose speculative capitalism. We also want to see a wealth tax and I don't want to take Oxfam's thunder, but I think we will see them release our report on just how wealthy the wealthy are and it's time they gave back. So this and more we can fight together. But it will take indeed a long-term approach. We have to see what we call patient capital and our pension funds actually there's around 40 trillion dollars invested in the global economy. It must be patient it must be based on the conditionality that all, uh, all companies have to face around both sustainability and around uh, 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 measures like tax and, uh, and the rest. And we certainly want to see reform of the Bretton Woods institutions along with the WTO and of course, even a review of our central bank mandates. We need transparency. And for all the corporations' activities and the investors, we need mandated due diligence, where they have to be forced to assess the risk, to have grievance procedures, and indeed to affect remedy with all of us in, the, in support of that. The EU's promised to mandate due diligence. They've actually promised uh, renewed taxes like the digital tax. We need to see this through. But finally on the EU, they gave us a window of transparency where they opened the door to patient debt as well as patient capital. Because we saw out of the last crisis that evil marriage of the bond markets and the ratings agencies simply kill economies when they were struggling to get back on their feet. This time, at least the EU recovery package has half of its funds towards an environment where nations can get support, but it could be 10 years or so before they pay back when they have the capacity to do so. That's probably medium term, but we certainly need reform of the way we think about the financial system. The G20 finance ministers are critical to all of this. If they don't lead, along with the OECD countries, then of course we know that the most vulnerable of our countries are left in just that situation. So we value your support and your partnership and uh, indeed in return you have ours. This is a fight for all of us to see that people and the planet are aligned with an economic future that is indeed just. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's uh, really, really motivating to hear you and a great reminder that when we talk about our money, our jobs, our future, our lives this summer, that is what this is about. Jobs are a crucial part of that. Um, world leaders have failed us, but workers have not. Uh, so thank you. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone to Arunava Ghosh from the Council on Energy, Environment and Water uh, from India. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Aggie, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon here in India. I don't know uh, what is the time at different places around the world, um, but very nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I represent the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, which is an independent policy research institution in India that works on uh, using data uh, analysis and outreach to explain and change the use, reuse and misuse of resources. Uh, we've been ranked amongst the uh, 20 best climate think tanks in the world. Um, we are, of course, faced with an extraordinary situation uh, where we're faced with a confluence of shocks, um, public health shock, a shock to the economy, a shock to employment and decent jobs, um, a shock to administrative capacity, 
and a shock to social cohesion. Um, coming out of this is not going to be easy. But we also believed, and India went through the toughest and the largest lockdown in the, in the world. We believed at CEW that imagination cannot be locked down. So what do we do when we try and come out of this? We focused on prioritizing equity. We focused on looking for new investment and growth opportunities that would also have high jobs coefficients. And we looked for opportunities that would be more resilient and more sustainable against future shocks. Using that framework, we came out um, just, a, just a couple of weeks ago with this document called Jobs, Growth, and Sustainability, a new social contract for India's recovery. The first economy-wide uh, pathway that has been outlined and was released by a senior cabinet minister with more than 25,000 views on launch. But what does it say? We simply argue for a new social contract that would rest on two core pillars. Pillar number one would be a commitment to jobs growth and sustainability. And the second pillar would be building resilience against tail end risks, risks that have very low probability on paper, but can have devastating impacts if they come true. Let me start with the latter and come back to the first in a minute. In the time that we have released this report in two weeks ago, and since then, the official climate change assessment from the government of India has found that over the course of the century, India is going to be hit by climate change far worse than the rest of the world on average. Um, for instance, sea level rise in the North Indian Ocean will be one, one and a half times the mean sea level rise across the world. Our calculations at CEW shows that since 1972, we have about uh, we've been faced with about 478 extreme weather events. Most of those have happened after 2005. In the past 20 years or so, India has suffered about $80 billion in damages because of extreme weather events. So a razor sharp focus on tail end risks is necessary to protect vulnerable infrastructure, vulnerable communities. The one, the, there are several ways we've outlined how we go about doing that. Step number one would be to build a detailed high resolution climate risk atlas on which CW is already working. So you have a 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer grid to understand the kind of impacts that different parts of the country will face. We need to have heat action plans for our cities. We need to have much more climate resilient infrastructure for the new cities that are coming up. We need to have what we call an integrated emergency surveillance mechanism, and we put out a design for it. And we need a unified emergency response framework that can involve the citizens in the emergency response um, before, during, and after. But there is that other pillar about jobs growth and sustainability, about how do you rebuild this economy when we are faced with severe unemployment and a, a likelihood of recession. And we argue that there is, uh, if we start squaring the so-called impossible trinity of jobs, growth, and sustainability, we find a lot of opportunities, starting with the micro, small, and medium enterprise sector, which has more than 60 million enterprises in India and employs more than 190 million people, a bulk of India's uh, work, non-farm workforce. Once we start giving them, just as uh, uh, Sharon was talking about, we give them appropriate working capital, uh, protect, uh, insurance mechanisms, protection for livelihoods, they can then become the backbone uh, uh, for the, the Indian economy. But let me also give a few specific examples and close off this intervention. Over the last three years, India's renewable energy infrastructure has beaten its build out of thermal power infrastructure. Um, but we believe that actually you can have significantly more, about uh, $30 billion of investment can come in with a small amount of uh, a credit enhancement uh, subsidy from the government. A, a, a build out of one point, uh, uh, oh, sorry, 160 gigawatts of solar and wind can create a workforce of 330,000 people. 
There is already news that there's possibly more renewable energy targets that can come out, which can create up to 530 million, uh, 530,000 jobs uh, with 130 gigawatts of wind and 200 gigawatts of solar. But even small scale infrastructure, distributed energy creates seven times more jobs than utility scale solar. So there's huge potential there. So the final question then arises, who will pay for all of this? And this is where the way we allocate subsidies and government spending becomes critical. We spend seven times more on fossil fuel subsidies than on renewables or electricity or electric vehicles. Um, if we started redeploying these resources, shutting down our 25 year old coal power plants gives us more than two and a half billion dollars in savings compared to spending $2 billion in cleaning up those plants. So these are ways, some of the ways in which we can create the resources to then invest in the community resilience, to then invest in the jobs, and then invest in the enterprises that actually can build out a more sustainable infrastructure. So these two pillars for a new social contract is the, is the pitch from CEW. Uh, and, and once again, thank you for having me. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for that really um, interesting intervention. Uh, yeah, really, really great to hear. Um, and I just want to uh, remind people how amazing it is that, you know, we've had so many people come together in, in this time, in this short period of time where the, the global pandemic kicked off and um, we've been responding with our just recovery work and all, all the amazing partners that have come together. Um, we've had over 1,200 organizations officially join forces for a just recovery, um, which, is, which is great. And they represent, um, you know, we, we will have people taking action around the G20 moment um, and, and the uh, summit in over 150 countries. And we've had hundreds of thousands of signatures, tweets and more, all supporting a just recovery. And just to say, this is just the beginning. This is only the beginning. We've come together in this short period of time and our speakers are demonstrating already how much effort, thought and work has gone into um, positioning, uh, positioning countries around the world and people around the world for a just recovery, which is, I find it really, really inspiring. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I'm now gonna pass the microphone to Liddy, Liddy Nackpill from the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development. Thank you, Liddy. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's afternoon where I am based, which is in the Philippines. Um, I was asked to, um, well, I'm going to start up my video and see if it works. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so I was asked this afternoon to uh, speak a little bit more about one of the things that actually Sharon mentioned in terms of what are the immediate things that need to be done uh, in this time of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what are the immediate things that people need and so that they can cope with this pandemic and survive. And in fact, uh, uh, what is really very important is to lead us down a path of changing the system, the economic system that we have, because clearly, uh, this is the system that has made our people even more vulnerable to the pandemic. And one of the problems of this system is the debt problem, which is what Sharon touched on in terms of the immediate demands. Um, this has been a problem, of course, pre-COVID-19, pre-pandemic, pre-economic crisis. We have been dealing with this issue for decades in the South and especially in Europe. It's, it wasn't saved from this problem as we saw the dramatic Eurozone debt crisis that happened, uh, that unfolded just several years ago. Um, this problem is one of the reasons why our health systems were not just simply overwhelmed, but so, so inadequate to deal with a crisis uh, because we have been left with health systems, especially in the South, that are, have been very poorly uh, uh, supported by governments. We have been left with health systems that have been privatized. So very, very weak and very small public health systems in many of the South. And part of the reason for this is that for decades, our governments have been prioritizing payments of debt 
and uh, have been, in fact, asked to privatize our health systems as one of the conditionalities for continuingly accessing loans from international financial institutions, from bilateral creditors, and even from private companies and private banks. Right now, the immediate call about the debt problem is for debt cancellation and debt relief. And that is immediate because so much of our resources right now are tied up still with continuingly uh, paying for these uh, debts, uh, outstanding debt of the total uh, number of uh, uh, the whole total developing countries is more than $2.9 trillion. And more than half of this is actually uh, owed to what are called official creditors or government and uh, parastatal institutions. And uh, almost two thirds of this is owed to actually private banks and the financial markets. And so a lot of our resources, instead of going to uh, immediate responses for the health pandemic, instead of uh, going to immediate emergency assistance for those who are really badly hit, not just by the, the response measures to the crisis, but also the economic crisis that is uh, part of the impacts of COVID-19. Um, so th there's very little left actually uh, that our governments are able to mobilize for this. Um, the current um, debt relief responses have been very, very small compared to the huge need and the urgency. Uh, Sharon mentioned of the debt uh, suspension of payments, for instance, and cancellation of payments for one year. The cancellation of payments was offered by the IMF, but that's only good for one year. And the suspension of payments is not even cancellation of payments, but a postponement or delay of payments was offered, has been offered by the G20 countries, but only good from May of this year to December, end of this year. So an immediate call, of course, is a wider and far ranging uh, debt relief uh, response to this, not just in terms of amounts, because the amounts are very, very small compared to the need and compared to the huge uh, service, debt service that is being offered, uh, that is being paid by our countries. But there's also a very small number of countries that are actually involved. For the IMF debt relief, there's only about 25 countries that are eligible to receive this. And by the way, may, may I add, you know, many of our colleagues are also in, say it's very important to point out it's not actually debt cancellation because what the IMF is doing is that it's going to make available funds to pay off what is being spent by our countries for for debt payments during this period so that our countries will not be paying it so it's not actually a cancellation it's actually the IMF taking over payment for some time and our critique about that is, of course, that means there's there's not much uh, sacrifice, or actually there's there's no, nothing being given by the official creditors or lenders because they are going to be paid. Anyway, but by this instance, um, and for the G20 uh, countries, uh, the G20 offer of debt pension. Only about 72 countries are eligible for this, and these are the countries that are listed under IDA, under the World Bank uh, list of uh, what they call impoverished countries. And so we need much, much uh, bigger relief and responses to this situation, not just in terms of amounts, but also in terms of the countries that will be covered by relief. But we're also saying uh, in as much as this is really a very important chance for us to reboot and reset the economy globally and inside our countries, it is also very much the time to start taking steps to address the problem of the debt far more comprehensively and far more strategically than just the offer of very, very partial debt relief for a very short period of time for a very number of countries. And when we say strategic, we are also pointing out that the justice is a very urgent question in the, as in the problem of the debt. This is not just about the capacity to pay for many countries, but in fact, very centrally a question, a question of justice because we are posing a very fundamental question. And that is 
Why are we being made to pay for debts, most of which our people have not actually benefited from? We know that many of these debts were what we call supply driven. So these debts were being peddled by lenders and creditors to our countries for decades until we uh, accumulated debt to the extent that it's dominating our econ economy and economic management. Uh, we also know that a number of our governments have been involved in very corrupt activities uh, given this debt. Uh, many, much of this debt, and you all may say it's history because it's happened 20 years ago, but we're still paying off debts that were uh, contracted by dictatorial governments. Uh, some of the debts we may no longer be paying to the original creditors, but the succeeding governments borrowed from new sources in order to pay off the, the, the dictatorship debts. And, uh, and linking this to the, the climate crisis, a lot of these debts have been used to actually build infrastructures that have been exacerbating the climate crisis, like energy, energy infrastructure. Uh, to this day, we are still paying off huge debts in the billions that were used to support fossil fuel projects in many developing countries. So there are very important questions that need to be raised other than just the capacity to pay, other than just the need for the funds at this very critical time. And that is a very basic question of justice. Why are we being made to pay for debts? Our money, our resources, our money as taxpayers are being made to pay debts, most of which have, no, have had no real benefit to our people. So that's one of the issues that we are raising when we're talking about a just recovery, that debt justice must also be included in that. And I'd really like to say I'm very happy that we're talking about this issue now because we have been saying that this time, at this very critical time, we need a renewed debt movement uh, around the world in order to you know, underscore the urgency of this problem. And it's a, a matter of literally uh, survival for many people in the South. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liddy, for this crucial reminder of the importance of debt relief in, in enabling a just recovery. Um, this really is about justice, and that does mean debt relief and reparations from all debts. Um, it's, it's our money and it's about what we want to stop funding, but it's also about what we want to invest in. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to pass the microphone now to uh, Nakabuye Hilda Flavia from Fridays for Future Uganda. I'm really excited to hear from you today. Take it away, thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you. Okay, well, I am Hilda Flavia Nakabie and I'm a climate activist from Uganda. I am part of the Global School Strikes for Climate uh, that uh, were initiated by Greta Thunberg and we continue to strike every Friday to remind our governments that we need climate justice. Well, uh, today we are talking about our money, our jobs, our future, but the money we want and the jobs we want and the future we hope to live depend on the kind of lives we live now. Well, my mom always tells me that life is what you make it. Right now we are facing two global challenges amidst us staying relevant. That is climate change and COVID-19. Climate change is a global problem and so is COVID-19. They have no boundaries. They affect each and every one of us regardless of the gender, color, status, age. And our actions to fight these crises will depend on our future and the lives we want to live tomorrow. Well, the pandemic has created a big economic shock and its existence has meant taking very different decisions on the environment in a way that focuses on what's vital. And this new normal needs to continue even after COVID-19. 
more people or many people attitudes have changed but however good our intentions as individuals are it will take a lot more of determined moves by governments and corporate organizations to make sustainable decisions to help build momentum towards <laughs> global mobilizations and actions around these global challenges in order to have a just recovery for the case of uganda my country we have been experiencing um we, we were recently hit by hard floods as a result of changes in the rainfall patterns attributed to climate change. Several settlements on Lake Victoria and other lakes and rivers in Uganda have been washed away by floods, leading to several displacements of people, destruction of crops, and other properties like infrastructure, which includes schools, roads, bridges, hospitals, among others. Well, an estimated 173,000 people were affected by the floods in May. This figure is of May and forcing some of these people to relocate to temporary confinement and safety, making, other climate, making others climate refugees in other regions. Well, such conditions of displacement and overcrowding in shelters will most definitely compromise the COVID-19 response measures of social distancing among others and furthermore COVID-19 being a public health crisis well floods are known to trigger outbreaks of waterborne diseases and malaria which compounds the vulnerabilities of communities to COVID-19 well in response to COVID-19 the Uganda National Meteorological Authority season's rainfall outlook says that these climate change effects are not about to stop this means that the floods are affecting the efforts to deal with COVID-19 due to the displacement of people and the destruction of infrastructure, which includes hospitals. Well, since such communities have to deal with both crises, building resilience against them is therefore crucial in order to save lives and livelihoods. But the question is, what, do we, what can we do to achieve this just recovery? Well, many people's perceptions of the environment have changed. For instance, some people have resorted to walking, cycling, staying at home during the lockdown, and this had made many people to spend more time in agriculture, which is good because our country is an agriculture country and it's also good for the environment. Well, due to unexpected consequences like lockdown of industries, transport networks, and businesses brought to Brought due to COVID-19, it has brought a sudden drop in carbon emissions like we can see. And uh, there's clean air, uh, there's cleaner air, there's clear water, there are blue skies, and uh, animals are rotating in some cities. And on the other hand, there are a few changes. For example, the pandemic has brought widespread job losses and threatened livelihoods of millions, so there's an economic uh, activity stall. But the other is uh, simply quite the discussion around climate change, which is more difficult right now that, uh, for example, such events like the COP26 and uh, climate conferences and the climate strikes are going digital. But, well, uh, the response towards coronavirus has shown the difference that communities can make when they look out for each other. It has given us a lot of hope that rapid action could also be taken on climate change the same way it is taken with, by the same way it is taken as for COVID-19. The measures to enhance climate resilience can be part of the COVID-19 responses the same way those to contain and deal with the pandemic can be used to build community resilience to climate change impacts. Well, however, um, the massive disruption of our routines caused by the pandemic has come with an opportunity for us to move to a more sustainable lifestyle. But this will only happen if our leaders are willing to take concrete and decisive steps to encourage positive environmental changes enacted during the lockdown. Well, we can see that um, the promotion of 
climate resilient practices will ensure food security and a just recovery as well as reduce our community's vulnerabilities in these times. Well, and I wanted to share that these times of change uh, during uh, COVID-19 have led to the introduction of uh, lasting habits and most of them are good for the environment. Therefore, if we need to take action, we can, but why haven't we taken this action for climate. We need real action and this time not just talks. And I also wanted to end with a quote from President Macron, uh, where he said that people have come to an understanding that no one hesitates to make very profound, brutal choices when it's a matter of saving lives. It's the same for climate risk. This is the moment they have to be strong and bold to take radical steps to protect the environment. Like I said earlier, it's up to our government to make sure that these uh, measures put during lockdown are, are, are continued and they are, they, like our governments make these uh, measures taken more concrete and also make decisive steps to encourage these practices even after the lockdown. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Hilda. Uh, the youth have shown amazing leadership over the last few months and it's now our collective responsibility to really scale up our organising and to make sure that climate justice is a key part of recovery. So thank you for that. Um, I'm now just going to take a couple of minutes to invite everyone on the call to take action. Um, next slide, please, Nico, thanks. As you can see on this slide, we've put together a creative visual action with a make your own face mask guide. So the idea is that you can put whatever message um, you find most relevant as part of calling for a just recovery. Uh, we really want to celebrate the diversity of people taking action for a just recovery around the world and all the partners that we have working together on this moment. Um, and as you know, of course, with offline mobilizations being a bit more limited <laughs> these days than they once were, uh, visual digital actions have, have really come into their own as an important part of um, campaigning around this moment. So I just wanted to highlight that action for you. I think there's a couple of options that you can take. One of them is to uh, go on Facebook and pick um, a, a photo frame, which, is, which will be a, a mask that you can choose. And the second is to make your own mask, literally. And if you go to 350.org forward slash G20, there is a link on there. If you scroll down a bit, there's a, a, a hyperlink in blue um, that will take you to the specific guide. But yeah, the G20 page is our, our landing page for all our actions. So do, do have a look um, and, and see if, if you'd like to take part in, in any of that. Um, of course, the more people that do it, the better because visibility is everything around this time. Um, so thank you so much. I believe that our next speaker is going to be um, Tasneem Esop from Climate Action Network International. So thank you so much, Tasneem. Um, take it away. Thanks, Aggie. And thank you very much to 350 for, uh, for inviting me to be part of this webinar and it's a real privilege to follow from all our great speakers before me. Um, so it's very clear that we are living through historical times. What this COVID pandemic has laid bare of course is centuries actually of the ugliness of systems like colonialism right through to capitalism and neoliberalism. The inequalities that we are now witnessing e on a daily basis on all our TV screens, of course, while we're in lockdown, is, has been made visible. And as Sharon and Liddy and others have said, these are crisis inequality, poverty, injustice. Injustices that we're witnessing is not something that emerges out of this pandemic, but has been there for centuries, decades before. And I think 
we are all talking about this moment now being a real transformational moment. And if we look at the solutions to the, the COVID crisis, the climate crisis, to inequality, to racial uh, injustice, all of these struggles are in fact the same struggle. We have to fundamentally address the systems that have spawned um, all of these injustices. So I would like to suggest that in our just recovery, the important aspect of that would be the just part. That in fact, we have to ensure in any recovery that is being planned for, that we put justice right at the center of that recovery. We need to recognize, therefore, that black people of color, indigenous peoples, they have been on the front lines of these crises. Uh, and especially in developing countries, it is those uh, mainly poor working class communities and peoples who have borne the worst burdens of the climate impact and so that is the fundamental injustice that we, we have to address as well. And of course, we all know that they are least responsible for the causes of climate change. So the connections as we are seeing and recognizing now between these different crises is uh, therefore um, incumbent on us to actually ensure that any recovery that is being planned for takes care of all of these uh, challenges and injustices. So we have been working, of course, uh, and supporting 350 in the work on the just uh, recovery. As CAN International, we recognize that um, this particular opportunity for radical transformation has to be pushed by peoples themselves. We are not going to get radical transformation from those who have vested interest in the existing systems. So please have no doubts that, for example, the fossil fuel industry will suddenly say we're giving up <laughs> our um, interest in the sector and suddenly transform. It is going to be up to all of us. And as we are discussing on this call, an immediate opportunity, of course, is the G20 um, meeting coming up in two weeks. The decisions being made by the G20 potentially, and uh, remember that the G20 uh, represents 85% of the world's GDP. They also represent 80% of our global emissions. And the decisions that they potentially will be making uh, at their meeting will absolutely have an impact on the world economy. And obviously those decisions could potentially lock in what we have right now, the very systems that have driven the injustices that we've witnessed today. So it is incumbent on us to present our alternatives uh, that spelled out in the just recovery principles. We have to demonstrate our power as well when we do so. So we have to, of course, um, in that, recognize that there are a few things that it looks as if we're reaching consensus about already in this webinar. So the call for debt relief, debt cancellation, and in line with what Liddy says, is an important call that CAN International is also supporting and working for. The, we believe that all of our the economic recovery uh, packages and public investments to reboot uh, the economy and achieve transformational change should lead with creating millions of green jobs, which is absolutely uh, realistic. Uh, it has to contribute to local and regional strengthening of people-led initiatives and also will help power a just transition for our workers. And uh, uh, Sharon has already spoken to the initiatives that they're driving around that, that we support as can international. There are a few things that we think in this push for a just recovery um, and for uh, finance ministers to consider uh, are the following. One, we have to look at any forward-looking investments meeting environmental and social standards. 
um, that would have to, of course, include building resilient infrastructure. And when we focus on infrastructure, it is clear that, you know, these kind of investments in big projects, especially energy projects, is something that we could uh, look at in terms of reviewing because these crises, and especially the, the COVID crisis, has shown us that, in fact, localization is far more effective and impactful than these big centralized infrastructure that we're doing. And that social infrastructure that builds resilience into the future is critical. So, for example, public transport, investing in public transport, looking at investing in efficient um, settlements so our human settlements especially in developing countries has shown us that you cannot achieve um, social distancing and that also relates in fact when we have climate uh, extreme weather events it is those kinds of settlements that are mostly uh, devastated and so how we redesign our settlements the kind of housing that we build etc we have to invest, of course, in health and access to health, access to education. All of these uh, investments in social infrastructure and social services are fundamental also to addressing the resilience needed for dealing with climate impacts. And the IPCC 1.5 report is very clear about this. You know, being poor and suffering from inequality makes makes people more vulnerable to climate impacts. It doesn't allow for the ad adaptive capacity. And so addressing poverty and inequality is fundamental to dealing with climate change, but it's also fundamental to dealing with any of these kinds of um, multiple crises that we are witnessing today. We have to ensure that equity and the just transition is at the center of any um, recovery and there has to be investment in that. We have to look at our food systems, for example, and we have to invest in um, healthy and sustainable food systems that are based on the principles of agroecology. And all of these solutions that we are looking at for investment are solutions that address multiple crises uh, that we are talking about. Um, we obviously also have to ensure that we do not invest in harmful industries. So we have to stop fossil fuel subsidies, for example, and the G20 has made this decision, I think almost 10 years ago and has never implemented the decision. So we have to stop fossil fuel subsidies. We have to um, look at tax reform. And I think Sharon has already addressed that matter and we support that. We have to address the kinds of um, investment in the future of, uh, uh, in our energy sectors, so of course, shifting away from investment in the fossil fuel industry and towards renewable energy is a critical investment that we need to look. I think that we have, you know, before the pandemic, we have had all these solutions uh, in the climate movement that's been presented for many, many years. And with the 1.5 degree report, it's very clear that the scientists are saying we need radical transformation. And we have not, we've been putting pressure on our governments to do that, and this has not borne any, any fruit. And I think we have to understand that this moment, therefore, is a make or break moment. If we do not get this right, if we do not ensure that our governments and our finance ministers who are making these key decisions in the G20, for example, if we do not get them to completely shift away from business as usual, the uh, shift away from locking in the existing economic systems and social systems, as well as the political systems, actually. I mean, we've learned very hard lessons that political leadership really matters. And when you have autocratic right-wing leaders in many of these countries, there's no, no political will to address um, the needs of poor, marginalized, and vulnerable communities in particular. So I think all of us, it seems, we recognize that this is an important moment. We have witnessed just the impact of these multiple crises, especially on poor working class communities, and especially black and people of color and indigenous communities. 
And so it is beholden, as of, of course, on all of us to put as much pressure at national levels for just recovery. Uh, do not let the, the veil of a pandemic shroud these unaccountable and untransparent attempts by governments to just lock in uh, an unjust system. We have to push them at national levels. We have to push them at global levels. And the last point I'd like to make is, you know, of course, this pandemic has also allowed many of the governments who have real responsibilities in terms of the climate, the Paris Agreement, to step back and, well, we're not going to deliver our obligations. We're busy with a crisis at the moment, a health crisis. And we should not allow that because as uh, we have recognized, these crises are all interlinked. And we have to push our governments to continue uh, their climate commitments that they're obliged to fulfill, and especially developed countries who are still obliged to fulfill their financial obligations. Because that climate finance, uh, together with the debt relief, debt cancellation, et cetera, is important for us to also build resilience in the developing countries specifically, and also especially for poor and uh, working class communities elsewhere. So we cannot let them uh, take the foot of the pedal when it comes to their climate responsibilities as well. This is all part of climate justice and justice as a whole in the world that we're fighting for. So I think, again, thank you very much, 350, for inviting me. We have a huge challenge on our hands, but as history has shown us, it is with people's power, when we are all united, when we are all standing in solidarity, that we can achieve the kind of world that we're fighting for. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Tasneem. Um, a really inspiring and rallying call to action there and a good reminder that this July is such an important moment um, and one that can have an impact on our future for decades, if not centuries to come, um, combined with the, the other moments that will happen this year. Um, so thank you so much. We're running a little bit over um, but we're going to answer some questions now that have come through. So if you can hang on for a few more minutes, please do. And while we run through some questions um, and Nico, if we could just go to the final slide, that would be amazing. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and while we field these questions, please do feel free to check out 350.org forward slash G20 to see um, all the activities that we're proposing for this July. And please do sign the petition, spread the word and make your own face mask. I know I'm going to definitely um, be doing some of those myself shortly. Great. So we've had some questions. Um, the first question that we've got is for Lizzie. And the question is, um, how, how can we achieve debt relief? Liddy, would you be able to answer that question? Um, yes. Uh, from our experience, so there has been some debt relief that has happened across the years. Uh, I must say they were far from what we actually demanded of uh, demanded the creditors to give or the lenders to give. But even the the small amounts of debt relief that uh, they actually conceded. Uh, two or three times already in the last decade and a half, two decades, uh, we really had to campaign hard for. I mean, it's it. And I think uh, those of you who are part of the climate justice movement, part of 350, part of some other movement working on climate, we know this very well, that there is nothing that the system and these governments and these corporations will give us unless we fight hard. And that's the way we can get the debt relief. There's many lenders that are involved. There's what they call the public lenders or official lenders. There's the private lenders. There are many arenas where we need to raise these issues in the UN, in the G20, the IMF and World Bank and other international financial institutions. And they are all coordinating with each other. There's the Paris Club, so-called, these are the bilateral lenders. There's the London Club, these are the private lenders. So these are uh, different avenues and arenas where we need to raise our voices, but it's not going to happen unless we have big citizens movements to demand this uh, 
that cancellation actually is the word that we prefer because relief has been, uh, debt relief has been interpreted in so many different ways, including in ways where it wasn't actually relief for the borrowers, but relief for the creditors. It's really uh, different schemes where um, the big institutions have made sure that the creditors get their payments and that's how they have interpreted debt relief. How to help the countries pay rather than how to ease the burden of these countries. So yes, we need campaigning and we need huge movements to make it happen. Thank you so much for that, Liddy. Um, and we've got another question that's come in. And it is, what opportunities do you think that could come up along with um, COVID-19? So I suppose, what, what kinds of opportunities have been opened um, for campaigning and action uh, during this time? Um, Hilda, would you would you like to have a, a crack at answering that, or and then and then Arunaba? Perhaps you'd like to go ahead, Arunaba. Sure. Uh, thanks again. I think it's a very important question. Um, and I don't like the sort of glib talk of, you know, every crisis is an opportunity. I think every crisis is a crisis and the pandemic is a horrible humanitarian crisis. Nevertheless, what it does do is it focuses our attention on what we call tail end risks. What on paper seems like far out in the future, unlikely to happen, but when it happens, it hits us and hits the most vulnerable so hard that it unravels years, sometimes decades, of progress in human development. Now, if we have to learn any lesson from this, it is how do we become more resilient against future shocks, whether they're pandemics, public health shocks, vector-borne diseases, or other kinds of climate and environment-related shocks, uh, water stress, heat stress, um, agricultural output coming down, and so forth. Uh, here's a clear proposal, and since we are discussing the G20, I've put it forward. You know, uh, Lydia also talked about this in, in some ways. All the World Bank IDA countries uh, will get a total of about $130 million in terms of pandemic insurance bonds payout. Wimbledon alone is going to get $141 million from its pandemic insurance. This is the inequity we're dealing with in the world today. Now, the kinds of shocks that our countries face um, are going to be different. A, a, a small island state or a coastal community in a large country will have one kind of you know, climate related shocks. A landlocked country will have another kind. The principle of risk pooling allows you to pool and lower the or bend or, or the flatten the curve of climate related risks. Um, I propose that we create something called a global risk pooling reserve fund. You can, you can finance it through an additional allocation of the IMF's special drawing rights. So no additional public money needs to go out right now. The pool risk will lower the risk profiles while creating a much larger insurance cushion for the world's most vulnerable communities. There's one thing we have to learn from this crisis. It is that we have to think of the weakest links in our society, the most vulnerable, and prepare not just hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Thank you so much for that um, comprehensive answer. That's fantastic. We've sadly run out of time for today, um, but it's been really uh, great to hear from all of our speakers. So thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. And thank you everyone who's uh, tuned in to, to listen and participate and ask questions and it's been really really fantastic so just to um just to wrap up this july is such an important moment um for us for us all and it's one that will have an impact on us for for our future for decades if not centuries to come um, the g20 finance ministers and central bank governors will meet to discuss recovery plans while the eu heads of state will host their first physical summit since the pandemic hit 
to agree on how to spend public funds to build back the economy. And that's our money. That's public, public funds. World leaders have failed us and they failed us on climate change. They failed us in, saying, in losing so many lives to a broken health system. And they failed us in preventing police violence and institutional racism. So this really is a moment that we need to seize and um, take action together. And that's why, that's why we're on this call today. Um, and it's been really, really fantastic. So thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you taking action um, online and otherwise uh, and, and hearing um, all your messages on social media and more. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you much. All. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.